Thank you very much. And I'm greeting you from the University of Brighton Centre for Transforming Gender and Sexualities Research. I'm also greeting you in Afrikaans, which is the language of my country of origin. Goeiemiddag. And a friend taught me a few words in Welsh, so I'm just going to say pren haun da pau. So I'm going to talk to you. Oh, I think I might just need the uh, laser pointer. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the findings of a study that was commissioned by the European uh, Commission. It was a pilot study that ran over two years and it's ending in March this year. And the aim is really to reduce the health inequalities of LGBTI people. So there was a large group of people that worked on the study. So from University of Brighton, uh, Nigel Sheriff was our lead. And then I'm also speaking on behalf of Nigel and Nick McGlynn, which is the other colleague from University of Brighton. There were also people from Euro HealthNet in Brussels, Au Revoir, which is in Italy, ILGA Europe, which is a group of activists, and then National Institute of Public Health in Poland. So we were a diverse team of people, and each of these groups of people made a significant contribution to the research, and I'll, I'll show you what we did. So in terms of the background to the project, LGBTI people experience significant health inequalities that have an impact on health outcomes. So stigma and discrimination, social isolation, and limited understanding of the lives of LGBTI people by others lead to barriers in accessing health services. Healthcare professionals assume often that LGBTI people's needs are the same as those people that are heterosexual, but they are not. Many um, health inequalities are preventable. So member states and the European Union must work to develop high quality health services that are equally accessible to all. So the objectives of the study were to gain a better understanding of the specific health inequalities experienced by LGBTI people and to gain a better understanding of the barriers faced by both health professionals in providing care, but also the health, the barriers experienced by LGBTI people when accessing care. And then to raise awareness of the needs of LGBTI people and providing healthcare professionals with the tools and training to overcome these barriers. So the, the overall outcome of the project was really to develop a training package that will be available for all health professionals that they can use in their own environment to train other health professionals. And we've piloted this um, training package in six member states. So just in terms of the components of the project, there were uh, five tasks. The first task was a literature review of health inequalities to determine what are the health inequalities and what are the barriers faced by health professionals and LGBTI people themselves. We also did a scoping review across 28 member states uh, to determine what's happening in each member state. And then we did a review of policy across Europe. The second task were we did focus groups in six countries with health professionals and LGBTI people themselves. First task was to develop the training modules and then to pilot the training package. And then the fifth task was really dissemination and evaluation of the project, which is coming to an end this month. So the first task was a review of health inequalities experienced by LGBTI people and the barriers faced by health professionals in providing health care for LGBTI people. And the research reports are available via that link. And hopefully the training package will also be available on that link once it's agreed by the European Commission. 
So in terms of the scientific review, so as mentioned, we did a scientific review, a comprehensive scoping review, which included the review of key EU and international grey literature, and then also rapid reviews in 28 member states. And all of that information we pulled together into a synthesis report. So this is just the summary of the scientific review, the databases we've searched, and the inclusion and exclusion criteria to then finally identify 57 papers that we included in the review. Of those 57 papers, about 16 papers were systematic reviews or meta-analyses. So the review really covered a large scope of um, literature and research. So then, one of the questions we addressed in the research is, what are the causes of health inequalities? So why do they exist? And LGBTI people often receive responsibility for their own health inequalities. For example, some people might say that gay men are sexually liberal, and as a result of that, they have higher rates of HIV. However, the root causes of health inequalities cannot be linked to any one individual factor. So the root causes are often in the social, political, and cultural domain. For example, where LGBT people have no legal recognition for their partnerships or they cannot get married, the incidence of things such as depression and anxiety in that country for LGBT people might be higher. So if we then think of what the root causes are, it's often a combination of, of various factors, including cultural and social norms that preference and prioritize heterosexuality. As the previous speaker had identified, we also call that heteronormativity or gender normativity for trans people, minority stress, victimization, discrimination, which could be both individual but also um, institutional discrimination, and then stigma. And sometimes these factors combine with broader cultural and social factors to create health inequalities. So I just want to show you this map, which is a wonderful map by ILGA Europe, which is the activists uh, that participated in the study. And this map really gives an indication of sexual orientation laws in the world. So if you look at the red countries, so they are, um, in 72 states globally, same-sex sexual practices are criminalized. So the red countries um, are made up of eight states where people can receive the death penalty for same-sex sexual practices. The dark pink states are 14, where people can have 14 years imprisonment to life imprisonment. And the pink states, um, people can receive up to 14 years imprisonment, and those are 57 states. So the, the countries that are um, indicated by a blue shield are where people have protection in constitution, employment, and against hate crime, and that is in 85 states globally. And the green states are where people have recognition for marriage and civil partnership and joint adoption, and that happens in 47 states, included, including the UK. So legal protection and recognition is helpful, but change is required at multiple levels, including legal protection, challenging discrimination and stigma, with an emphasis on a shift in social and cultural norms to foster in social inclusion and recognition of diversity. So then I'm just going to share some of the findings of the scientific review with you, and it's very hard to choose what findings to share and what not, so this is just the keyhole vision of some of the findings. So what are um, 
the root causes of health inequality. So this is an example of heteronormativity. Uh, so where being heterosexual is assumed as the status quo or the only way of being normal. So sometimes the actions of health professionals may unintentionally be disrespectful or insensitive towards LGB people. So for example, a lesbian woman from Lithuania said, after experiencing the first symptoms of an illness, I feel huge emotional stress because I knew after turning to a healthcare facility, either I will have to come out as a lesbian and shock my doctor, or I'll have to conceal the fact and face many misguided questions. As long as I have the choice, I will stay home and will try to treat myself independently. The healthcare sector is alien, unsafe, and not understanding my needs. So then in terms of the inequalities for LGBTI people, and they occur at multiple levels, including both physical and mental health. So lesbian, gay, and bisexual people were two to three times more likely to report enduring psychological and emotional problems compared to the general population, including things such as depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and substance misuse. So in a study of over 2 million people, including 27,497 LGB people, 15% of bisexual women reported an enduring emotional or psychological condition, 18% of bisexual women compared to 12% lesbian women and 10% gay men. For heterosexual women, 6% reported an enduring psychological or emotional com condition and 5% of heterosexual men. So in terms of um, further findings, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual people reported worse physical health compared to the general population. For example, things such as um, musculoskeletal problems, arthritis, gastrointestinal problems, liver and kidney problems for gay men. And gay and bisexual men showed an increased rate of anal cancer. In terms of lesbian and bisexual women, they had a higher incidence of polycystic ovaries. 50% of lesbian and bisexual women attended cervical screening programs due to the perception that they did not need screening, placing them at a higher risk of developing cervical cancer. Amongst bisexual women, the reported cervical cancer rates were more than double that of other women. And then for intersex people, uh, dissatisfaction around health practitioners not gaining informed consent prior to normalizing surgery on minors linked to unnecessary medicalization of their bodies for some. And then trans people, their mental distress were also um, significantly raised. So in terms of things such as depression in 51% of trans women, 48% of trans men, with some estimates as high as 64%, anxiety in 40% of trans women and 47% of trans men. Same goes for suicidal ideation. However, we were aware of certain protective factors such as family and friends that acted as uh, social support. Also, uh, when transphobia was reduced and where personal identification documents could be changed. In terms of the barriers LGBTI people face when accessing care, and I think we've heard some of these things um, in the previous presentation. So in terms of communication, health professionals sometimes spoke in gender binaries, thereby excluding those who are non-binaried. So in terms of masculine or feminine or male or female or he or she, where are some people identified as non-binaried. Um, and documentation were often designed for heterosexual people only. So as a result of that, the lives and the partnerships and sometimes the health needs of LGBTI people uh, was overlooked. And then in terms of cultural and social norms, 
So health professionals sometimes assume that all people are heterosexual for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, or sometimes people's uh, bodies were medicalized for intersex people, or sometimes people refuse, were refused care or ended care prematurely for trans people. In terms of coming out, we know that coming out can be highly beneficial for both LGBTI people and also for health professionals. When health professionals come out um, to LGBTI people who access care, but some LGBTI people were scared because they feared hostile reactions from health professionals when disclosing their sexual orientation and gender identity. And the same goes for LGBTI health professionals. They were scared sometimes of, of being out in the work environment because of potential um, consequences. And then in terms of lack of knowledge, practitioners um, didn't have enough specific knowledge. And then just, um, and I'll skim over this just in aid of preserving our time constraints. So, for example, in Czech Republic, some people weren't aware, health professionals, that they were older LGBTI people, for example, in nursing homes. So some of the LGBTI people said it felt as if they had to go back into the closet when they went into nursing homes. Uh, because health professionals weren't really aware that people were LGBTI. And also, surprisingly, in our rapid review of member states, we found that conversion therapy still happens in 11 member states. Um, and that's based on the assumption that homosexuality, bisexuality, or trans identities are mental disorders and should be treated. So uh, a trans person in Slovakia just spoke about in the quote how uh, they saw a psychologist and the psychologist um, was religious and they suggested that they access um, a pro pilgrimage site that might help them be cured from their compulsion. So as a result of that, the person was very sad and kind of withdrew from care and didn't see the professional again. So then just briefly, the second task, which um, is the focus group study we did in six countries. Um, and it included 12 focus groups with 120 participants doing the same, which was mapping the barriers healthcare um, professionals faced but also LGBTI people face uh, when accessing care. So the objectives were the, were the same as for the first study. So the aim was really to develop from the focus groups material that could inform the training package. So the focus groups um, happened in six countries, including the United Kingdom, Lithuania, Belgium, Poland, and Italy. Just in terms of demographics, we tried to include um, as wide demographics as possible. We did struggle to recruit intersex people um, in two countries. Uh, other than that, the spread of people who participated, both for health professionals and also for LGBTI people themselves was fairly broad. The analysis happened according to three coding cycles uh, and we used in vivo for that purposes. And then the report was structured according to um, what are the inequalities faced by LGBTI people, the barriers, and what kind of training need to, to happen both from the perspective of health professionals, but also LGBTI people themselves. So I'll just give you time to read that quotation.
So this just gives an indication of both the importance of coming out, what difference it can make when health professionals are aware people are LGBTI themselves, but also in some healthcare settings, LGBTI health professionals um, weren't sure about whether it's safe to come out and what the repercussions of, of that might be. And then, oh, sorry, am I going in the wrong direction? And then what kind of training do LGBTI people think healthcare professionals need? So I'll just give you time to read the quotation again. So some of the literature used in healthcare professionals' curriculums, um, and in this instance, a medical curriculum, in Lithuania was outdated and was still speaking about homosexuality as a disease. So it was still um, medicalizing homosexuality um, unnecessarily as a sexual disorder. So there's a need to update curriculums and training materials uh, to reflect current practice and, and also policies um, both in the UK and also within Europe. And then the last quotation. So just to say that health professionals aren't the only people that came in contact with LGBTI people. Additional staff, so for example, receptionists or parking attendants can make the work of other professionals much easier if they were included in training initiatives um, to become up to date and also to develop greater appreciation for gender and sexual plurality and fluidity. And just in terms of the recommendations, so further research is needed to determine the general health profile, cancer burden, and health outcomes for lesbian women, bisexual people, trans people, and intersex people. So there is information out there, but they are mostly small-scale studies. So we, we need larger-scale studies to determine the general health profile. So LGBTI people should be included in research, also in policy decisions about health care delivery to respect um, their own health-related concerns. In terms of practice, improved access to mental health services is needed where psychological support and talking therapies are provided for LGBTI people, particularly trans and intersex people. And then training of health professionals in all member states should occur to aid knowledge of LGBTI health needs. So we've piloted the training package in six European countries, and we hope that this training package will be rolled out to all member states. We're not sure what's going to happen as a result of Brexit, but I trust our partners that worked with us on the study will take uh, the work forward. Oh, sorry, and then in terms of just um, frequency and organization. There's also a need for updating undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum and literature throughout healthcare professionals' education and continuous professional development. So not only for those people entering the profession, but also people that have been in the profession for some time. And healthcare professionals and LGBTI people could work together to create institutional and wider change. So these are the reports, and they are available on the site, as I mentioned. And those are my colleagues from University of Brighton and also ILGA Europe that uh, worked on these two tasks with us. And then just to acknowledge that there were many people working behind the scenes who participated in the project, and we just thank them for their contributions. Thank you. <laughs>